Friends Cafe is an informal platform uh, where we uh, where we bring in some of the best scientists in the country and they speak about the topics that they're passionate about, that they're interested in, that they're working on. And um, usually we have this in a nice cafe or a nice community space where uh, there is there is a presentation by by the scientists, but there is also there is a lot of informal chat. So the chats after the presentation and the talk uh, have been you know uh, go on for a long long time, and uh, and the atmosphere is just wonderful. So we are trying to recreate that online on Zoom, and hopefully you will all just bombard us with questions, interrupt us whenever you want, uh, interrupt Axel uh, and Rajani. I'll introduce both of them in a bit uh, for this and today is like is a very special day it's world b day and we have with us to speak about this very important and relevant topic uh, and for a change it's a non covid based topic which i think uh, will be a big relief <laughs> for everyone here that we're uh, thinking about something that is not covid 19 um, so we have with us first axel dr axel brockman he is the principal investigator of the Honeybee Lab at the National Center for Biological Sciences. He is interested in the mechanisms of animal behavior. Honeybees provide the opportunity to study mechanisms, mechanisms of behavior at the level of the individual and at the level of social organization. And also, honeybees are one of the few model systems to study the interaction between individual behavior and social org organization. So researchers are able to manipulate the social structure and analyze its effects on the individual behavior, brain physiology, and brain and brain gene regulation. So Axel, if you ever meet him around campus and you ask him about bees, you have to take out around half an hour at least. Uh, and uh, he gives you so much information about bees. It's, uh, it's amazing. So I've got, like, I have these memories of chatting with Axel at different points on campus and speaking about bees. So, he is uh, probably one of the best people in the world to speak about this subject. Um, and, uh, and that's not my personal opinion. It's the official opinion of NCBS. Um, and with us, we have uh, Rajani Mani, who's a filmmaker with Elephant's Corridor Films. It's a Bengaluru-based environmental film company. Rajani is working on India's first film on wild bees and the impact of human activities on bee populations in our country. The film was triggered by her own experiences in her community where earlier honeybees were eradicated using pesticide, pesticide sprays. So uh, Axel has worked with Rajani uh, very closely on this film and uh, they are here uh, to uh, speak, about, speak about this film, speak about bees in general. And uh, just so you know, um, I'm really looking forward to this discussion. So I'll be handing it over to Rajani now. Rajani, uh, over to you. Um, and I'm stopping my screen share. So you are all on the live. Yeah. Thank you, uh, uh, Chandra Khan. Um, first of all, uh, a big thanks to Blisk uh, for giving me the opportunity to uh, join a live conversation with uh, Dr. Axel Brockman of uh, NCBS. Also, congratulations uh, to you on your uh, 25th uh, Science Cafe on this very special World B Day. Um, I also welcome all the people who have tuned in uh, uh, to hear this conversation this evening. Um, uh, so a friend uh, called me this morning and we were talking about how we rarely get a chance to meet people like um, Axel, who he called islands of excellence, right, in their fields. So I'm really looking forward to talking to Axel today and I'm sure uh, you're all as excited about it. And, um, but before we dive into all the question and answers, uh, I want to show you um, a short trailer of my uh, film, Colonies and Conflict. So um, I started working on this film at a point where I was uh, personally traumatized uh, by how people in my community were spraying pesticides to get rid of bees. And uh, Axel was one of the first scientists that I uh, met. Uh, he sort of uh, demystified uh, the world of bees for me. And uh, since then, I've met a lot of uh, scientists and researchers uh, in our country uh, who are doing uh, some great work uh, you know, to understand uh, the nature of bees and the impact of human activities on bee population. And, uh, and I realized that research is uh, so important for conservation because 
um, uh, how can we, uh, you know, save something that we don't understand, right? So the past year and a half has been a great learning curve for me personally, right? Uh, but before I go on and on about this, uh, let's take a look at the trailer and then we can get started. Chandrakant, can we uh, see the trailer? Yes. Dorsada in particular, they had this really, really unique ability to fly at night. They're the ones that are going to nest on their balconies in their apartment complexes. They are not only flying during the night, they are also communicating with a famous dance language to kind of the nest mate, the direction of a food source. The Apis dorsata is treated like a pest insect. So people that have a colony on the balcony can call pest management and pest management will kill the colony. The agriculture in India is different. It's based on small farmers and only nation is done by the wild honeybees. The big problem in India is that the importance of pollinator for food security, public is not aware of that. No one cares. Today, the availability of wild colonies has uh, diminished. What the reason could be is hard to tell. They are facing conflict everywhere. It is not only in the urban area. It is it is also in tribal area, in, in Western Ghats, maybe in forest area, also in agricultural area. Along with bees, there will be other ecological gains that we don't know yet. We will we will know after maybe you know, 100 years when we lost everything. Yeah. Okay, so uh, that was the working trailer of my film. Um, there's a bigger story out there, but we'll have to wait a little longer because we are still in production. And, uh, yeah. I loved it. Okay. <laughs> that was so amazing. No, it was so amazing. I loved it. It was so. Um, I, I mean, I really felt like it. It talked to. It talked to me. It was. It was so close to home. Right. So fantastic. Yeah. I just want to also, sorry, Rajni, sorry to interrupt. Um, yeah. I just want to also invite everybody uh, who's here as an attendee, please uh, come right up and put your hand up at any point during this presentation. Uh, science cafes are not webinars. They are not supposed to be serious academic um, seminars or meetings. This is supposed to be um, a popular science talk. So please, at any time, put your hand up, involve yourself in the conversation, ask a question, make a comment on Axel's glasses, whatever you want to do, you can, you can do whatever you want. Um, it's completely democratic. All you've got to do is put your hand up and we will, uh, we will enter you into the, into the chat room. So just wanted to say that, Rajni, uh, great uh, film and thanks. Yeah. 
Oh, it's, it's just a trailer. The film is going to come out next year, hopefully, after all this COVID thing, uh, you know, dies out and we are able to film again. I've lost two big seasons, important seasons already this year. So I don't know where it's all heading, but uh, yeah, thank you, uh, right? So uh, before I start asking Axel all, you know, the lots of questions that I have, I want to take a, a small poll, um, you know, with, with all the people who joined us. And I believe Chandrakant will uh, help us with the, with the poll. Um, so my question is, and you have to answer really honestly, uh, the question is, are you afraid of bees? Uh, do bees scare you? Okay. Now, uh, the answers can come from your personal experiences, uh, just close encounters, childhood memories, stuff that you've read, watched on YouTube, TikTok, anything. So the question is, are you afraid of bees? Do bees um, uh, scare you? And your choices are A, terrified, and B, not scared, all right? And we'll take in the poll results whenever they come in, uh, and we'll see who's scared and who's not scared, right? Yeah, the Please poll. vote. Uh, the poll is up. Please vote, everyone. If you look at the bottom of your screen, you will see polling next to um, uh, share screen, I think. But you should see it at the bottom of your screen. Just click on that. You'll see the poll. Please vote. We have around 90% voting so far. Okay, good. To <laughs> All right. So can we like go on to the, uh, you know, the talk um, and then let the votes come in and we'll see when, whenever it comes in, right? Yeah. Yeah. So um, knowing Axel, I know he's not the person who's terrified of bees or anything. He's a really brave person. He's quite the opposite of, of being terrified. And his whole life is dedicated to honeybee research. Uh, he is, uh, you know, so, so what I want to know from him personally first is what do you find fascinating about honeybees? <clears throat> okay, uh, good. Um, <laughs> um, David. <laughs> okay, so I was reading somewhere that, uh, you know, like, um, uh, you know, somewhere they were comparing foraging honeybees to traveling salesmen, right? And uh, they could, uh, you know, calculate the, the shortest possible route to uh, the least amount of time. And, uh, you know, I, I find that that's so intelligent. It's more intelligent than me because I don't understand routes and I can't navigate uh, to save my life. So, uh, you know, how do they, I mean, how are they wired to do this? Yeah. Um, <laughs> Let me um, first explain that uh, uh, when I started studying biology, uh, I wanted to become a neurobiologist. So uh, I, I was interested in um, how the brain works. And um, when I started, uh, uh, so everyone wanted to do electrophysiology. And um, so putting kind of electrodes into the brain. and. Uh, Actually, I had to uh, realize that I was not able uh, to open the skull of a mouse personally and to do that to vertebrates. And uh, when I had to decide um, what to do, um, I, um, I had a course uh, on honeybees and um, doing a little uh, learning experiments with honeybees. And, and, and there it started that I got fascinated with honeybees. And, um, uh, uh, and throughout my career, I mean, how to say there, uh, there are many animals model systems that we can use for neurobiological research way easier. But uh, honeybees um, are probably the animals with which you can do the best and detailed behavioral experiments under natural conditions. So, we don't know how they do the salesman's uh, problem, uh, solve it, but we know that they can solve it. We don't know how they do it, but we can do experiments that show us that they are capable of us. The, uh, the latest story about what, so people think honeybees are intelligent, but uh, the most important thing is they tell us how intelligent they are. So, so uh, and, and many animals don't tell us. And, um, so, and, and all this uh, uh, is, is based on the division of labor in honeybees, that uh, there are foragers that are going out. And among these foragers, some will always visit the same spot or the same tree. So they have the tendency to go back and forth to the same tree from the hive to the tree. 
And this behavior, we call this um, flower constancy. And this natural behavior allows us honeybees to train to come to a feeder. And, and if, the experiment, okay, if the experimenter can then at the feeder ask the bee a question. So train kind of the bee, so we are training them with sugar water. And we put the, um, we put, uh, the sugar water over a blue cardboard and we have next to it a, uh, a container with water over a yellow cardboard. And then we can change the position and the bees are coming. And then we can just put out the cardboards. And this is, was an experiment Carl von Frisch did a hundred years ago. And he demonstrated that honeybees have color vision. And, and nowadays we are doing the same experiments, just more complicated. And so the honeybees can tell us what they do. I stop, right. otherwise I'm talking the whole. Yeah. No, so you were talking about the, uh, you know, you kind of uh, mentioned the social structure of honeybees and, uh, you know, I find them like quite like humans in like in the sense that they're compartmentalized, like you have bees to do every kind of job, like right from scout bees to soldier bees to nurse bees. So that's very uh, interesting, isn't it? Yeah, so, uh, <clears throat> it's, so uh, as a social organization, they have something like division of labor. And uh, so um, in, 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 in different social insects, it's different how the division is done. In honeybees, it is that actually uh, each, each worker does different tasks at a different age. So when, uh, uh, when the worker is born, it will first clean the cell in which it was uh, kind of um, uh, raised. And then it uh, starts um, um, taking care of the brood in the brood area where she also kind of emerged. And then it goes through different kind of um, tasks, tasks that have to do with um, building the comb, building the nest. And the other task is with food processing. And at an old age, it goes out and forage and it forage for um, pollen, forage for a nectar and forage for water. And um, <clears throat> so it's the same bee that goes through all these processes. Uh, yeah. So it, it would be that, so, uh, you know, 150 years ago, 70 years ago, we were thinking that each bee does it and kind of, um, we know it does it for three days, the one task and task B for the another three days. It is not that, not that so. And there's also some genetic bias. So some are kind of skipping some tasks. But everyone starts as a nurse bee, taking care of the brood, and ends at the forager. Yeah. Okay, okay, that's interesting. Somebody has uh, has come in saying that division of labor according to age is called polyethism. Polyethism. Okay, yeah, perfect. Interesting. <laughs> yeah, thanks for that. Uh, right. Um, okay. Uh, another interesting thing that uh, that I read in New York Times uh, one report is that bees can uh, recognize human faces. Uh, I like to believe that it's true uh, because I will tell you, and you can correct me, uh, because uh, you know when. Uh, I've seen the bees when they come onto battlefields. I've been observing them for quite a while now. They'll come, they kind of see, they'll, you know, figure out, okay, this is a non-threatening, threatening, or if they feel that these people are okay, then they come and build the hive. And they, they just don't care. We can go really close to them. And they don't, you know, the bees, they do this warning wave. And uh, like while filming, I have gone so close to Dorsata bees on the urban bees. And they don't, they don't care. They don't mind that I'm there with like a you know three uh, inch long lens and you know filming them and so do they do they um, you know can they recognize do they have the ability to recognize um, human faces? Yeah. So, so the um, so the one thing is that they certainly um, if you're going close to the hive, they. Sure. they Actually, is your face red because of a bee sting, or what? are you just blushing? Someone is asking. Uh, I'm blushing. <laughs> oh, okay, just I was immune against being bee stings. <clears throat> yeah, as soon as you're done, I've got, I've got okay, some questions I, for you. I, I'm a white, right? Kind of, you see that. And um, uh, okay, let, let me go back. So, um, honeybees, so the, the, the answer um, is that uh, honeybees have to recognize flowers. 
in, and because of that, they probably have a really high capability of recognizing patterns. So, and the people that demonstrated that they can learn faces, they trained bees kind of to visit a feeder in which kind of behind there was a face. So, and, and that means a picture. So, so th they are capable then of um, uh, pattern recognition. If they can identify you as an individual, a specific individual, we don't know. I know that uh, from my uh, own uh, behavioral experiments experience, um, when you have, so uh, it, we keep bees uh, in an out of flight cage. And um, if we time train them, uh, that means that we are providing food only at a specific time of the day. Uh, and, and, and then if, um, if I or the students comes in, the bees are already waiting for the person to come in to provide the food. And actually uh, they are flying close to the person. Yeah, so they can at least kind of um, learn that there is someone coming in uh, putting uh, uh, sugar water at the feeder. Okay. Yeah, I think lots of questions have come in now. Um, Rajani, yeah. we have a couple of people who've raised their hands, so yeah. maybe you yeah. can uh, unmute them. So let's begin with uh, Ajit, Abhijit. Um, Abhijit, Abhijit uh, you can uh, uh, unmute your mic and ask your question. What is the life expectancy of bees? Okay, good. That is easy and not so easy question. So, um, so the first of all, it's always talking. So we have, and we are talking about that later. So it, depending on which honeybee species we are talking about, we are talking now about Apis mellifera. Um, it is um, like about uh, thirty days in the summer. So three weeks, no, wait a minute, in, uh, no, it's six weeks. Three weeks in the hive, three weeks at a forager. And, um, but uh, uh, this Apis mellifera species mm, or the population that's coming from Europe, um, there the bees have to overwinter. And um, for overwintering, the bees that are overwintering, uh, they live up to three months. So there's a huge plasticity, yeah? And when I'm saying three weeks in the hive, three weeks foraging, then probably under the circumstances of um, um, a, a huge flowering, they work themselves to death and maybe only live one uh, week as a forager. Thank you, sir. Yeah, welcome. Yeah, are there more questions? There are lots of questions. Um, I have asked many of the people to put their hand up. Um, I believe uh, Liaquat has a question. Yes, sir. Yes, sir. Mm, hello, sir. I am doing MSc entomology, sir. Mm -hmm. I have read that these honeybees lack cement layer, but I am not mm -hmm. able to understand why. What was it? The honeybees they lack the cement layer, the outermost layer, like cement layer, polyphenol layer. But honeybees lack the cement layer. What is the re reason, sir? Like the what? They lack the cement layer. Sir, the outermost layer. The outermost layer. Cement layer, that is uh, wrong. So uh, you mean cuticular? Yes, sir. Yes, sir. In cuticle, they lag the cement layer. What is the reason, sir? Uh, so you are asking me a question I don't answer. I don't even know what the cement layer is. I know what the brain of that honeybee does. I'm sorry about that. No so, problem. No problem. Actually, I searched a lot about it, but I was not able to find any research. So, that, so. Well, I, I would have to check that. And, and, and um, yeah, sorry. Okay, sir, kindly help, sir, if you find the answer, kindly. Rajani, uh, yeah. Rana wants to know what particular species of bees you're filming. Yeah, so I st I'm filming uh, all the honeybees. Um, that's, uh, um, you know, Dorsata, um, uh, mainly Dorsata Serana, because Serana is the beekeepers association. And, uh, Floria, mainly footage, uh, just to show different varieties of bees, but also native bees, solitary bees as well, because not enough is uh, known about uh, solitary bees and people don't really know. So I want to make a film that's simple uh, enough for um, everyone to kind of understand the world of bees, uh, you know, the Indian bees. But the story stems from 
my own personal experiences uh, in Bangalore, uh, which is of course the Dorsata bees. Uh, there are some other uh, questions as well. Um, somebody wants to know what's the difference between the um, Drosophila and honeybee as model organisms in research with respect to feasibility? Oh yeah, okay, good. That's a good question. Um, <clears throat> so um, we do not know, we do not know anything about Drosophila and what it does in nature. Drosophila has been a lab animal than more than 100 years. It is now, so the technique because of the genetic manipulation is this way that people now can manipulate one neuron in the brain and we can test whether that neuron has a role in a specific behavior. This is at the moment the gold standard for causal mechanistic experiments. Now, honeybees are totally difficult for genetic um, studies. They are difficult for electrophysiology, but they are the best in kind of doing behavioral experiments and doing behavioral experiments under natural conditions. Honeybees are the model system to demonstrate the capabilities, the sensory and behavioral capabilities um, of insects. So for example, the, uh, I didn't say it before, the, the latest biggest story about honeybees was that honeybees have a concept of zero. These behavioral experiments, you can do behavioral experiments to demonstrate that in honeybees, you are never capable of doing such experiments with Drosophila. So if you wanna understand higher behavioral capabilities, cognitive capabilities of insects, you, you better take honeybees. You have a problem understanding what are the brain mechanisms underlying it. But maybe in the future we will do. Does that, does that answer your question? <clears throat> and I want to say, I think students way more love behavioral experiments with honeybees. Okay, we've got some more questions, um, Axel. Mm -hmm. um, Ganesh, do you want to ask your question? Uh, yeah, uh, hello, Axel, and uh, Alex, uh, hello, Rajni, ma'am. Uh, yeah, this is Ganesh. So I just wanted to know uh, uh, that whether uh, mobile networks interfere with the navigation of bees, because I know that uh, the bees use uh, sun as a navigatory tool and their dance languages also. But one of them, uh, I just want to know whether mobile networks can interfere. And the second question is, do we have any uh, natural predators like murder hornets have been discovered now in uh, USA. So do we have some that kind of thing in India as of now? Okay. Um, yeah, so I think that there is no, there's no solid uh, scientific study on the effect of kind of like um, uh, these um, mobile phone um, uh, waves, etc., cetera, etc. Cetera. It's it's coming up. You know. So how to say? I love beekeepers, but beekeepers are not scientists. So mm -hmm. they do observations and kind of like maybe they have a colony next to a kind of like an electrical pole, and then this colony is behaving kind of like strangely. That observation is good, but uh, if you do science we need to have a higher N number and then study it. So okay. I think so far there is no kind of um, solid scientific study. Okay. The second question, um, predators. Yes. yes. There are predators of honeybees. There are birds. Mm -hmm. um, I'm sorry, I don't know the name. And- There's um, a bee eater bird. Yeah, bee eater. Yeah, bee eater. yeah, yeah. yeah. And, and um, certainly the uh, baths are also hunting uh, for uh, bees. The, okay. um, uh, 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 so, but how to say, so we don't have the problem that is now kind of in the news in the US. And, and this gives me the chance to say something very important for the Indian audience. The Indian audience is informed about honeybees by 
English newspapers and Western newspapers. And most of these reports are about Apis mellifera. And we'll come later to that. Apis mellifera is not native uh, to India and Asia. It's native to Europe and Africa. And, and, and there's only little reports about the honeybees that are native to India. And how to say, for example, we have, a, we have the bird, the, the bee eater, the, um, uh, the, uh, the flight of the Asian honeybees is less predictable than of Apis mellifera because Apis mellifera doesn't have the bird predator. So it's not adapted to a bird predator. It just fly, uh, flies straight. With Asian honeybees fly more like a zigzag. The same is um, the, a, a big problem in the Western world about honeybees and what they are talking about is Apis mellifera is the um, parasite varroa, it's a mite. And for the um, humongous de declines and kind of like all the annual after winter declines in honeybee colonies in the Western world, this varroa mite is responsible. This varroa mite um, is evolved on Apis serrana, the, the Asian hive bee. And the Asian hive bee evolved resistance against this varroa. So again, kind of like if people are telling you about uh, kind of like um, the difficulties and threats about Western bees, about varroa, varroa is, is for example, not a problem in India. I mean, I think, that, so this is, if I have a message and if I kind of preach, I would say kind of like how to say, we have to know um, the Indian honeybees and the Indian bees and, and talk about that. The news is full about um, this Western Apis mellifera. Wow, okay, so Axel, we mm -hmm. have 27 questions pending. Mm -hmm. I don't know how you and Rajni are ever gonna say anything except answer questions, but it's yeah. World Bee Day, so we're going to persevere. Okay. Yeah, um, so th th I saw one very interesting question on, on bees, uh, how they communicate. I mean, are you going by a uh, by a order of? Yeah, we are going by an order. Okay. Yeah. Um, yeah go ahead. Okay. So uh, Ayushi is asking, a question about can network can network affect bees in their gene? No. I mean, I would say there can be a lot of things, but uh, so network that's the same question as the phone uh, question. I, I think this ought to say as a scientist, I should say we haven't tested it, so we don't know. I'm saying st um, strictly no, because it's a little bit like what we see now with COVID-19 there's a lot of false information, particularly in the social media. And, and this whole uh, phone network business uh, is in my opinion also something like uh, social media, false information. Next question. Okay, uh, the next question. So Rita is asking, are bees scared of humans? Huh. They should be, no? I think they should be. Oh. I, I think they're not scared. They're really cool. <laughs> they're not scared of humans or anything. Oh, see. So, and that has probably something to do with the poor. Maybe I kind of... Um, so, bees, as many animals, are scared of animals that come close to their nest or their house, right? And or close, so to say, so in a social organism, it's the nest. In an individual, it is kind of like the distance. And how to say, if you're coming close, they get alerted. If kind of like how to say, you can come close to a honeybee colony if you move slowly. And I think that is also what Rajani did. So you have to move slowly. Yeah. And, and, uh, and, and here kind of like you see also differences between the species, um, how fast they attack you, right? If you kind of, how to say, bump against a, um, a 
box of bees, they come out and kind of defend uh, their nest, right? Yeah. Um, okay, uh, we also have a really interesting question from Maha who says, how are bees used to detect bombs in airports? Uh, okay, good. So um, also that is a story. Um, so uh, uh, bees cannot detect bombs by themselves. What bees can is they can learn the smell of uh, TNT. So, um, in, and so you might kind of, I, I think that was always the idea. You train bees to learn the odor, kind of like with sugar water. And if you train them strongly enough, these bees that have been trained my, may fl fly out in the airport and then kind of just go for the smell of TNT. Here's a problem about a learned and an innate behavior. I think that you can train the bees to TNT, but how to say, if they find a flower order, they go for the flower. Okay, um, Indra wants to know, you've said that a single honeybee can do various jobs throughout its life, mm -hmm. but uh, is there any relation to that with hormones? Yeah, perfect. Uh, that's true. I mean, so the development, I mean, the adult development in honeybees has something to do with hormones. One hormone is a juvenile hormone. And, and that is very comparable to uh, adult development uh, in humans, kind of like the transition from a child uh, to a, uh, an, an, an um, young adult and an adult, which is also regulated uh, by hormones. And similarly, honeybees, the brain of the honeybee changes uh, during this phase. Same as the human brain changes. Okay, great. Um, there's also a question about the, the humane removal of bees in urban settings. So uh, Somjit says, I read that robots have been built. How effective are they? And are they commercialized as yet? And um, getting trained removals for this task could be a task in itself. So how has this worked until now? Yeah, okay, good. There I'm kind of like how to say, um, uh, um, so you don't need robots, you just need trained people if you want to remove um, honeybees or, or from balconies or, um, I mean, I, so stingless bees that are in the wall, it might be more difficult, but you just need uh, skilled humans and uh, skilled humans are probably more efficient than robots. I, I, I don't know that, but I don't think that one needs robots. And particularly, so if you have it, it um, so I know a beekeeper who removes a dorsata colony from a balcony by smoking and et cetera, other things, and he is not wearing any whale. So he is so confident and so experienced in, um, uh, uh, in dealing with the uh, honeybees that he can do it. And then, okay, so also, also he's immune. We don't need robots. And, and I would say, if, if you know how to deal with honeybees, um, uh, uh, you do not get stung that much. Yeah, also in the, in the trailer uh, had shown uh, this person called uh, Venkatesh, who, who bags the bees, okay? He'll bag it in a sack and then he'll, uh, he takes it to a little distance away and he uh, releases. Of course, there are casualties, but at least, uh, you know, the queen gets saved, so. Yeah, yeah. I, also I think, how to say, so, uh, I mean, someone who's talking about robots and getting uh, bees removed, um, there's being afraid, no? I mean, I ought to say, I think, you know, how to say, you can be afraid of a dog you have been bitten by a dog and then you are kind of like afraid of dogs for, for the whole of your life, right? I mean, that is for, this, for the individual person a problem, right? But how to say, the humans can kind of like um, deal, kind of perform with dogs, right? And, and I think that we should aim for a similar um, uh, um, connection with bees, right? Don't, so try to understand them.
So we have a couple of questions from YouTube, and uh, Pradeep asks uh, about the seasonal migration among Apis dorsata and Apis floria in northern India. Um, can you shed some light on that? It's a more technical question, though. Yeah. yeah. <clears throat> okay, I don't know much about northern India. I, I know something about southern India. So, um, but it probably so I also don't know what he. Did. So whether he means the Himalayas or just Northern India. So Apis dorsata and um, Apis florea and probably maybe also Apis serrana, they have um, the seasonal migration. It's kind of a monsoon related. For Bangalore, people know that the bees are disappearing, right? So and I think it starts in June, a little bit before the monsoon. So the colony is absconding. And, and so far, we don't really know where they are going. I think it's a, a totally interesting uh, um, scientific question. I mean, our kind of uh, question in general, where do they go? It is difficult to observe kind of um, um, a migrating swarm. Um, uh, uh, there is some observation. Uh, there's a paper on the migration in Sri Lanka. So, and I think that's uh, almost the only one. Uh, there that um, the people are saying that uh, the colonies, are, so there it is, they are migrating from the mountain area um, to, uh, uh, to the flatlands and, and about a distance of 250 kilometers. And, and they probably do this migration uh, over three weeks, over several weeks. So um, how to say the swarm, is probably is, is, is flying for a distance, then it can kind of aggregate at a big tree or at a um, cliff. Then it might need food, then for a few days, it might try to collect food. And then they are kind of like uh, migrating further away. So, and then the interesting thing is that uh, there are some studies, uh, two studies that um, indicate that the colonies are coming back from where they started, yeah? So, okay, that is clear also from other migrating um, insects. They are flying in one direction and then they are coming back. And the interesting thing here it is that um, Dorsata uh, uh, likes to uh, um, have colonies in aggregations. And, and for example, uh, 20 years ago, there was a big banyan, there is a big banyan tree at the Ag agricultural university and that was full of uh, dorsata um, colonies, 70 to 100. And uh, in, in Northern India, there had been a study 20 years ago where people demonstrated that, or kind of showed that these colonies are, uh, uh, or some of the, so these colonies, you know, so they genetically analyzed and, and provided evidence that probably colonies are coming back to the spot from where they were observed before they left. Yeah? And that is of course a an, an totally interesting and enormous migratory capability. I mean, coming back to the places. And, and uh, it, it, I would love to uh, study it. I think um, because it's seasonal, um, uh, uh, the hypothesis is that it's also hormonal hormonally regulated, right? And, and, and we see that, for example, for Apis florea, uh, we are catching florea colonies and bring them on campus uh, to do experiments. And um, uh, uh, when we get them in June, there's a high probability uh, that the colonies will abscond. This to, uh, this to that, and if there's more questions, I can talk in more detail about it. So we have a couple of questions which we think we can get answered live um, with people asking. So uh, Somjit and Anushri will go next. Um, so we'll just unmute them right now. Yeah, Somjit is going to ask his question now. Somjit, you can unmute yourself. Sorry, uh, can you hear me now? Yeah. 
Yeah, so Dr. Brockman, I, I like many others stay in an urban setting in Bangalore. And whenever there is a hive which comes up in the, uh, in the apartment complexes we live, immediately the request comes that remove the hive. Uh, while I have been trying to educate the folks that, hey guys, be patient. It is a matter of 90 to 100 days that the bees will go away on their own. So if you can manage it for uh, till that time, that will be fine. No point removing them uh, or scaring them off or using pesticides and things like that. So am I correct in saying that? Or uh, is there a definite timeline I can tell them to be patient so that the guys will come, the bees will come, and the bees will go in a stipulated time of, say, 100 days, 120 days from the day they start making the hive? So I, I have been not accurate there. I'm just trying to buy time uh, so that the bees leave on their own. So what is your view on that? Uh, I think this is a good observation. Um, and uh, sorry, one sec. And Rajini, I think you can share your experience when you uh, helped your apartment also with this uh, situation, right? You also convinced people on um, on the best way to deal with this. So maybe you can share your experience. After yeah, yeah, yeah. So in my case, it's really simple. I just bombard them with scary information and terrorize people <laughs> to back out. And uh, you know, so that uh, <laughs> you know that that's a simple you okay. know, policy that I follow. Okay, let me, let me answer this question because um, yeah, it was interesting. And um, so the, the colonies are coming back after the monsoon. And um, that is October, November. I think this year it was even later. It was kind of like December. Uh, so, and, um, and, so and, and we did a study, um, uh, with the gated community that were asking us um, to give them advice how to deal with the bees. And um, the, so, so there's, the problem is, um, has several levels. So I think that um, killing bees with pesticides should be omitted. It kind of like, so it, there is no need to kill the colonies. There are ways to remove a colony without killing the colony. To remove a colony, you have to have a beekeeper who is smoking the colony and then cutting the comb. And the colony for the colony will come. So the uh, so he's smoking them. The, all the bees are flying up. He can cut the comb. Then the bees are coming back and searching for their nest. They are clustering as a swarm. It looks and the swarm looks like the nest, they will stay there for two or three days and then they will abscond. That is the, 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 the least harmful way to get rid of a colony on a balcony. Then what people don't know is that Apis dorsata has preferred nesting sites. If you have a dorsata colony on your balcony, then your balcony is a preferred nesting site. We don't know why and what, what they, are very, they are really picky about what to choose. On NCVS campus, we have three locations and only on these three locations, kind of like the dorsatas are making nests. And it is always kind of like an overhang. And, and it's actually that the, um, that the colonies are always nesting at, at, the, at the similar spot. So if you have a colony on your balcony, your balcony is a preferred nesting site. You can ask a, a beekeeper to remove, remove the colony, but then what you have to do is you have to do something to the ceiling of your balcony to kind of avoid that a new colony will attach its comb there. So how to say, it's, it's so short-sighted if you're just killing because then, Actually, even a few weeks later, there a new colony may, might come. So, so, so you have to do something about kind of that. Like you have to avoid that the bees are capable of um, attaching a comb to the ceiling. It, it, totally easy. Um, um, a tool for that is just hanging a mosquito net just two, three, two, three centimeters below uh, the ceiling. So. Coming back to the 
100 days. So because that is, that's a nice observation. So we observed um, the colonies at the gated communities over two years. And if we um, just um, measure the total number of colonies, we see the nice seasonal um, pattern that has something to do with migration. So the colonies are coming in October, December, in January, the curve is high, and then it goes down coming to the monsoon time, and then it goes up again. But interestingly, if you are looking, actually, if you are uh, counting um, arriving and departing colonies, then we found out that most of the colonies are only staying for two months. And then kind of like uh, um, they are going away. So underneath the seasonal migration, we see something like of short-term migrations. There is on, so that I haven't heard about that before. I know that there is for Apis florea study and it is possible that, um, so how to say, so this uh, colony needs food and, 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 and they are living only with one comb. They are not living in a cavity as kind of serrana or mellifera. So they can move around and kind of like if the kind of like if the nesting um, conditions are deteriorating or if kind of like the food availability is, is decreasing, then this whole colony can decide and go somewhere else. Yeah, and that is what they are doing. And, and this is also an, an interesting um, phenomenon. And so, so they are even more migratory um, than I thought or many people thought. And that is, of course, like how to say elephants do that the same way, right? So elephants kind of, um, I have a colleague in uh, IIC who studies elephants. You can, how to say, there's a lot that you cannot study with elephants, but you can put GPS on, on their back. And there you can see that also elephants kind of are going, kind of moving around. Um, and they are actually by tradition knowing good food places. And whether bees know the food places, I don't know, but they are also going around um, uh, searching for new food uh, uh, um, nesting places with, with a better food availability. I mean, so, so um, you're only, right. only 58 questions left, Axel. Okay, good. <laughs> Okay, uh, Pavitra, there is, uh, there's a question, uh, just what Somjit asked, uh, there's a parallel question to that. So I, uh, you know, um, I am, I don't know if that has come up, but I, I feel if I ask this and it, you know, it'll kind of go in a flow. Yeah, right? yeah. Sure. Yeah, so uh, just, uh, you know, to add to this, uh, that, um, you know, you have the problem of, uh, you know, uh, the bees on the balcony, but I think an even bigger problem is that these bees, they get inside the house at night. Right, mm -hmm. and uh, that's a really big issue with uh, families with children, you know, with small children, babies, and they feel that the bees will uh, bite them, and they're worried about the safety. So here, it's uh, I feel, uh, isn't it a bit strange for bees uh, to be out at night? I mean, knowing that uh, you know that they use the sun for navigation, uh, how are they, uh, you know, uh, getting inside homes? Yeah. Um, <clears throat> so um, Apis dorsata is unique among all the different honeybee species. And I'm just mentioning the, um, the number. So there are 10 to 11 honeybee species. And Apis dorsata or the Apis dorsata uh, group is unique in that they are capable of flying at dim, dim lights. And uh, under natural conditions, they can fly on full moon nights. Yeah, full moon nights they can fly even in the night. Regularly, they uh, 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 um, can fly uh, during dawn or dusk, right? But so in full moon nights, they are flying in the night. And then similar to other insects, they get attracted to light. So now the situation is a summer in Bangalore, kind of in March and May, it's very hot. You are opening uh, the balcony windows. And it is, uh, so here it's also the problem in Bangalore and the city might be also that the ambient light that is here because of kind of electrification, I mean, lightning might be sufficient. So 
and and how to say and i'm saying summer nights because in cold nights they cannot fly they need to, they need a temperature so a summer night kind of like you are sweating inside you want a kind of wind coming in you're opening windows or balcony windows and then the bees are flying and they get attracted to the light inside the apartment and they get caught by the light so they will fly around the light source and and you know, kind of like they cannot land or whatever. And the problem is that the flight trajectories is very unpredictable. And I think this is what people scares. And, and the bees, so the bees are caught by the light and they cannot kind of get away from the light. So they will fly, fly there till they get exhausted. And that is what you see then on the next morning, the dead bees on the floor. You can also see that in hallways where you have kind of lightning you see the dead, uh, the, the dead bees. So the, so the, it, I, I totally agree that that is scaring, and um, uh, the, but the bees are probably not that the bees are the bees are not aggressive. What the bees want to do is they want to find a flower. They are on a foraging trip. The problem is, of course, if they land somewhere or if you get a bee in your hair, right? And if you have, have a curly hair, they get stuck in the hair and then you get uh, get a stung and um the how do you say so in my opinion okay so um so the easiest way to deal with that is um okay one could have fly windows right or kind of like if you have them how to say if you have them already in your apartment switch off the light put a light source on the balcony and, and the bees will fly out, yeah, because they are going to the light. So you can actually direct the flight uh, with light. Yeah. Right. Yeah, so we have an interesting question from someone who um, owns um, a couple of beehives, who has a couple of them. Um, Anushri Krishnamurti. So maybe we can. Uh, she can ask a question about what happens with uh, when the queen bee leaves the nest. Uh, Anushri, you can speak. Hello. Uh, good evening, Rajini ma'am and uh, Dr. Brockman. Uh, I'm Anushri Krishnamurti and uh, I'm an undergraduate student studying uh, animal sciences. So I, we, we rear bees at home. We have two hives. So one of those hives contains the whole colony, like the worker bees the, and the queen. Whereas the other one just has the workers and does not have the queen. So uh, the one without the queen, the bees, the, the beehive without the queen left the hive after about two months that we started rearing them. And we know that, uh, you know, the worker bees and nurse bees, they nurse the young larvae. They feed them royal jelly so they de develop into a queen. So why couldn't these bees just stay back and rear a new queen? instead of leaving? Ooh. So, um, okay, is it Apis Serana or, or Apis Mellifera? It's Apis Serana. Serana, Serana. Serana. Yeah. So because Apis Mellifera probably would not abscond. Um, I have actually out there, I don't have an answer, right? Um, uh, uh, so you expect that, um, I mean, how to say, so if a colony uh, kind of loses a queen, the colony, the first thing the colony tries to do is kind of rearing a new queen, right? Yes. And um, so uh, the larvae are uh, bee potent. So uh, kind of like an egg is bee potent. An egg can become a queen or a, a worker. And um, that uh, developmental decision is done, uh, I think, in the first two or three days of the larva. So if, um, if, uh, if, a, if a colony kind of loses a queen, the workers are trying to um, uh, rear the early larvae to, be, to become queens. And, and then, okay, good. Then it takes maybe uh, a few weeks. And, and then that queen is um, virgin, right? And, and maybe because kind of like you said uh, that the colony left after two months after you observed that the queen was missing. So, so then, um, uh, the, then the colony was waiting probably. So this is, 
you know, kind of like this is what I'm hypothesizing. Kind of like the, uh, the queen needed to be mated. And if it was still in the mating uh, time, the virgin queens kind of went on mating flights. And maybe then after that, the colony decided to leave. Um, uh, Serana is also, um, uh, it, uh, so how to say, it's similar, although it is nesting in cavities, it's probably similar um, prone to absconding and, and kind of, uh, let's say not absconding, Ab absconding is, how to say, absconding is a term of a beekeeper, right? That means the bees are going away. So how do you say for a colony, it, it means it is searching for a new nesting site. And searching and, and, and changing nesting sites is actually adaptive for the colonies because um, parasites and pathogens like the comb. And kind of like, if you want to get rid of them, you better leave the comb behind and go somewhere else and, and build a new nest. This is the kind of hygienic behavior. So for whatever reasons, and I cannot tell you the reason why that colony left, but the colony left. Is that kind of like a little bit helping you as an answer? Yes, yes. I mean, are you? you I, I had a related question as well, because once the queen, if there is no queen, um, maybe we can go into that a little later. Sure, sure, sure. Yeah. Thank you. So, so um, I just want uh, to, sorry, are you done, Anush? You have, you have another question? It was just a small continuation to the same thing. Okay, go on. If I could, yeah. So we know that if there's no queen, then there's no pheromones that would stop the worker bees from developing the new uh, eggs that would develop into a queen. So how long do pheromones... No, 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 no. no, 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 no. So what, what was the point? No, if, no. If, if so there's the, no... Yeah. So if there's a queen, then uh, kind of... How, how to say? So, okay. You, did you say that the queen is inhibiting the production of new queens? What was? Yeah, the there's the pheromones produced by the queen that inhibits the ovarian hormones of the workers, right? Yeah, yeah, yeah. So how to say the? I don't know how it is in uh, uh, in Serana. Maybe in Serana it's even stronger than in Melifera, right? If the queen, if there is no queen, so then different things are happening, and, and I know it more specifically from Melifera. So it, in Melifera, it is that the colony is strongly kind of like showing signs of disintegration. Yeah. And, and as I said that, so, and probably, and it is also a dynamic phase. As I said, one response is that workers, and that is probably nurse bees trying to kind of um, try to make a young larvae into a queen. Then there might be, um, so as you said that the, um, the workers' uh, ovaries are uh, repressed by the queen pheromone. So some, some of the workers might try to lay eggs. That is not, not many, but some. And they are trying to lay eggs, but these eggs are unfertilized. And, and, and actually, the, the workers are not very good in egg laying. They, um, they lay uh, several eggs uh, uh, in one cell. So it's also more disintegration. So but was that your question? So I would just want to know if the, how long would those pheromones last? Because they stayed for two months, even, even though the queen wasn't there. No, so what, so see, so what I kind of like, so how to say, we don't know what happened in that colony, but if the colony, so either, so either it is something that I don't know from mellifera, then I cannot say anything about it, right? right. So my, at the moment I'm referring from mellifera. So, are you so for example so so my hypothesis was that um, they reared an emergency queen, and so did you later check whether there was a young queen in it? Hello. Hello. Yeah, you can speak, Anushree. Does that answer your question, Anushree? Yes, yes, it does. And no, there was no uh, queen later. I checked. You are sure? Yes, yes. Okay, good. I mean, then, okay. Mm -hmm. Then it's an interesting um, observation and I, yeah. I will keep it in mind. So, um, uh, you know, so, the, um, 
we do not know. Actually, so um, I don't have this now at the slide. If you look in the scientific literature, uh, then 95% of the scientific literature is about Apis mellifera, and 5% oh, yes. is about the Asian honeybees. True, so, true. Um, so, what I say is you have an observation, and then that might indicate some interesting phenomenon, then one has to try to study it. Yes, I would like to discuss with you maybe later regarding this. Yeah, that is, you can kind of send me an email. Sure, so thank you, thank you so much. You're welcome. So, um, we have come to the end of our science cafe. Um, but, but, um, we've had such an overwhelming response and we're so, we're so kicked about this. We have about 60 unanswered questions and about six hands still raised. And I don't even think that Rajini and Axel have even gotten, I think, 20% past their presentation. You know, a lot of questions got answered, like, uh, you know, because people were asking. Oh. But uh, yeah, a couple of questions. I wanted Axel to talk about, uh, you know, um, uh, native, uh, the uh, solitary bees as well. Uh, because, uh, you know, Uh, uh, solitary bees. Uh, so we didn't get a chance to talk about that. So, but but um, so here's here's a suggestion that I'm putting to Rajini, Axel, and to the 76 uh, attendees that are here right now. Would you guys be okay, or would you guys be willing to come back for a part two of this session? where you can continue to ask these questions, harass Axel, completely um, completely cut off Rajini, you know, the usual. Would you, yeah. would you guys like to have a second? We can extend the session by another maybe 20 minutes, but a part two would be great because we think a part two will give us more time. And please keep your questions. They're so interesting. Please keep them. We will set up another call maybe within a week's time if Rajini and Axel are free. And we can do this again and have a continuation. But we can go on for maybe another 20 minutes if, if it's okay with Rajini and Axel. Yeah, fine with me. Yeah. Okay, so we go on till 6.30 and then we will come back with a part two. But if you are, if you guys are willing for a part two, please will you give me your comments because you don't want to waste Axel's time either. Sorry? Maybe we can do a poll about that. Let's do a poll about that. That's a good idea. Pavi, yeah, let's we, do never, a poll about we, that. We, we, we don't know what happened to the first poll, right? Uh, well, I have two results for it. Yeah. Yeah. yeah, I can share the results of the first poll. Yeah, yeah. what was it? Very brave people. Ah, brave, huh? Very brave. No one is scared. <laughs> so, <Arewa>. yeah. good. <laughs> Very nice. I like this, uh, you know, all, all of these, uh, you know, attendees today. Good people, right? So why don't so, you tell us about yeah. the poll, Chandu? Yeah, so 34% are terrified of bees and 66% uh, are not scared of bees at all. There's no, no. middle path or what? There's only like no. terrified no. or not scared? No, so the thing is that uh, after all these, you know, we kind of uh, uh, bulldoze through all the questions. And I think if we do the poll again, I think the 35% the who, who are terrified will probably not be terrified anymore, I think, maybe, right? That's actually so much. Yeah. Pavi, do you want to put up our second poll? So just we get a sense of how many of our amazing attendees. I mean, I am so kicked. So many of you guys came. I'm sure it has to do with Axel and Rajini. We're, we're, we're nothing in this whole thing. I know that. Um, but without any further ado, Pavitri is going to put up a second poll right now. You have an, like another 20 minutes. Um, we're going to take some questions. So everybody who's had their hand up, let's take your questions. Um, Let's so, so Anishri, uh, I think you're done, right? So I will put your hand down. So Ayushi, you had a question. Would you like to ask your question? Ayushi, Ayushi Chaudhary? Would you like to ask your question? Good evening, ma'am. Good evening, sir. Hello. Yeah. So my question is, uh, like, what is the difference, like, queen bee, worker bee, and uh, drones? Like, uh, I heard about drones also. They also like communicate between each other. Uh, yeah. Okay. <clears throat> the drones are the males that make the queen, and the workers um, 
are the daughters of the queen. And in uh, honeybees, um, the workers, the daughters cannot mate. I mean, okay, the worker, the, the daughter that are workers cannot mate. They basically do the work where they, so, and, and the daughter that's becoming a new queen that can mate again. So in a honeybee colony, there's only one female that can reproduce and that's the queen. And that is the reason why the queen is so important for, and so valued for the colony. The queen kind of, how to say, uh, is not, it's not directing the colony, right? She is actually not a queen. I mean, in that sense, the decisions, are, the decisions that the colony has to make are done by the workers. The workers decide when it's time to pr produce drones and when it's time to produce new queen and when it's time to increase kind of the size of the comb and produce more workers, right? So um, uh, it's, the things in the colony are decided by the workers. And, and so then um, uh, uh, there are some morphological differences between these two groups. So sir, how they communicate between each other? Okay, so honeybees um, have uh, two major um, uh, communication channels. And one is, is odors, like pheromones. And the other one is, um, it, um, how to say, mechanical communication. I mean, so how to say, as kind of like, how to say, bees do something similar. If you want to active, if you want to wake up someone, you kind of go and kind of use your both hands and you kind of, um, uh, the, what the English word, I mean, um, <clears throat> you shake them. And there's also a shaking signals in honeybees where a worker is kind of shaking another honeybee and saying, come on, you have to work. So sir, we use the same technique with uh, when we train others bees, like uh, uh, like training our bees and all. So we use this technique also. And you train bees? To what, to a feeder? To no, train uh, others bees. So do, do, do bees train other bees? Okay, that is interesting. So <clears throat> we haven't talked about that and we can talk about next week about that, about the famous dance language and um, which also my lab studies and uh, which there was a Nobel Prize for. But so, um, if a, so, if a bee fly, uh, so if a bee finds a flower and, and the flower kind of provides uh, super good nectar, she comes back and then she wants to activate nest mates to go out to that flower. And she does it, she gives the direction with the dance, but on, so on her hairs and their cuticle are kind of like odor molecules from that flower. And actually the, um, uh, the nest mates can smell that odor. And then if they are flying out, they can use this the memory of that smell to find that flower type. So in that sense, um, it is so they are giving them a probe of that uh, order and, and, and the nestmates can learn it and can use it for navigation uh, in the field. Thanks, I just thanks. want to say that Ayushi has this, this is a great uh, tactic, Ayushi. You put your hand up and you ask three questions. This is very good. So amazing, <laughs> I hope you got your answers. Thanks so much. I should have come in as an attendee. I would have got better chances to ask Hello. questions. Happy to see that our poll has a hundred percent answer rate. I mean, not a hundred percent answer rate, but everyone has said yes. You have no choice now, Axel. No yes. choice. And uh, we'll we'll throw the question over to Harshit Mishra, who has a question. Ashit, please ask your question. Hello. Yeah. Hello. We can hear you. Yeah. Uh, good evening, Rajni ma'am and Axel sir, big fan. Uh, so my questions are three. I have seen a video on National Geographic where bees uh, that are potentially queen fight each other and the winner becomes the queen. So is that true, first of all? And does this ritual or whatever you want to call it change from one species to other? And relating to the queen, again, I've heard this royal jelly, which is initially fed to the 
young bees but eventually they are fed something else but the queen gets the royal jelly always uh so is that true and how how is that done and the third question is a bit diff uh, a bit away from from this concept so we know we know that bees can see in the visible range of uh, the electromagnetic spectrum so does the vision range uh, increase or decrease like is it does it extend to infrared or ultraviolet and how does it help them that's it okay good that's it so he was even more smart like he kind of like put it out <laughs> with three questions at the beginning so it's to three totally different questions so what was the first question so is there a competition between uh, yeah. two potential queens yes so um at least for apis mellifera it's documented and um it, so um in apis mellifera um there are two way so so the, there's a competition but also so how to say it, so it's it's difficult so it depends on so the colony is producing several queens in florea i have seen 20 queen cells right the colony is producing many queen cells because it does not know you know how to say which one will emerge maybe one can die right so that so you are producing in abundance and then um the colony kind of like how to say the swarming process is that um the um uh, in melifera is that the old queen is leaving with half of the colony and then kind of of uh, the oldest kind of uh, so the first emerging virgin is checking whether there are uh, um other queens a uh, virgin queen and then she is um she can kill it so i and i don't know how often this is actually happening under natural conditions but i know that people are uh, that they do that and it could be that also the worker are interacting so i think that the workers are the major so if they want to have two queens um alive they take care that they don't queens don't um uh, find each other yeah so but it so it is not it is, I, i think it's so I, it it is always kind of documented like this but i'm not really sure whether it's really in nature like this um uh, uh queens can duel and kill one another but how often it is happening i don't know okay so the second question was uh the queens of fed fed royal jelly yeah. uh, okay so, so royal jelly um is produced uh, by um nurse bees in the hypopharyngeal gland and um there was, there was always um the dispute whether it is only better food that the queen becomes or whether there is also some protein or genetic um information so better food means actually that you kind of develop faster and the development so and and if you get uh, less food uh you stay retarded right because kind of like how to say the queens and the workers have a different morphology so the question is how is this different morphology kind of initiated and i think there is a few years ago there was a study that even with the hypo uh, uh, with the royal jelly um there's also rna transported uh, into the larvae so and then this rna could maybe then kind of help to also um kind of change uh, the developmental pathway but we think that um so there's a food and then it has an effect actually on the hormonal regulation and then the hormonal regulation sets sets in earlier and you have a faster development and that's the way you become a queen because how to say the eggs have the same genome so in the third question the third question i remember so b c in the ultraviolet and um the ultraviolet um is used uh, mainly to perceive the polarization at the sky so um and um i don't know so uh, two things so i I'm, i'm wrong so it's used for the polarization at the sky and it is also used for detecting of flowers so um if you kind of uh, photograph a flower so a flower so we cannot see in the ultraviolet so a, a flower might just uh 
occur for us plainly yellow or plainly white. If you kind of have a UV filter on it, then you see actually that there are color marks that are only perceived in the UV. And, uh, and insects, and many insects are kind of sensitive in the ultraviolet, um, they can see this. And so they can use it for the uh, detecting flowers. And, and in the flower, actually, it is that these marks are kind of basically kind of guiding the bee into the flower where the nectar is. And we are calling this nectar guides. So they can, can they see uh, yellow or do, do they see the ultraviolet version of yellow? Example, uh, if they see a yellow flower, do they see the yellow color or the they see the yellow and the ultraviolet? Both. Yeah, and then kind of like how to say, so, but I'm not really uh, an expert in that. Um, so it is, all, of course, if they um, kind of then in color vision, you, you mix sure the inputs. So, so uh, there might be slight differences in the way they see the colors, yeah? But kind of like a yellow. And so they, they are insen insensitive in the, in, the, um, uh, in, in the dark red. And if a um, flower is dark red, it might be, um, so they, they might not see that red, but then there might be other kind of colors that they see. And there's always a distinction that, for example, I think that red colors are more for um, uh, uh, bat or bird pollination. But how to say, so how to say, they see, the, they see the flowers differently than we. And if we are talking about red, it might kind of, the bees are seeing in the flower something different. One last question, sir. Uh, uh, Arshad, we really don't have time. Sorry. Uh, I, Rajini, okay, okay, fine. Rajini, there was a question for you about uh, filming um, it, bees compared to other animals or insects. Can you share about that just very briefly as our last question? Yeah, sure. So uh, it's really difficult to uh, film bees because uh, it takes a lot of patience. And uh, we um, have to be out at a specific time. And, uh, you know, so some, sometimes they tell us, uh, you know, uh, we, when we talk to farmers, if you're, let's say in Coop, they'll say that, okay, come early morning. And then, you know, we find that even if you go early morning, uh, if the sun comes out, uh, you know, you'll see the bees there. Uh, so they really like uh, a little bit of warmth. And so what happens to us is when we go with a video gear, uh, it's too bright for us. So, you know, it's a real challenge, uh, where, you know, and not only that, uh, they are really tiny insects. So we need specialized uh, uh, lenses and, you know, a high speed camera. If you want to capture every single, uh, you know, movement, you want to kind of extend that, uh, you know, movement and see the beauty of, uh, uh, you know, of the bees. So um, it is really a challenge as compared to, uh, uh, to anything, uh, to filming any other animal. But at the same time, uh, when you are filming insects or, uh, you know, nature, wildlife, uh, it, you know, it, patience is a virtue. You have to like, uh, for that one perfect shot, uh, we stand for hours. And, you know, we can't sit like other creatures because bees are like flitting from uh, flower to flower. So we would be literally like chasing them around. And then we've also like, we've had learnings and they observe us. And I think the xylocopa, the carpenter bees, I find that they really are watchful and they, they dare us at times. Like uh, they will whiz past us, they'll check us out. And um, I mean, it's very pleasant. I, I never I understood uh, the, you know, uh, the beauty of, the, of bees, uh, you know, uh, in the beginning, it was just, okay, this beehive, a large beehive in the balcony. But now I've come to understand uh, and observed uh, that there are so many different kinds of bees. And each bee has, uh, I don't want to humanize, uh, you know, uh, the bees. But as a lay person, I, I find my uh, me often doing that. I feel that bees behave a certain way. And I can't, uh, you know, so for me, from my point of view, it's mainly an anecdotal situation. So um, it's fun, but it's really difficult. Yeah. That's so uh, I think uh, we are reaching the end of it, end of our time limit. I don't think the cafe has ended. Uh, Mahin, uh, would you like to say a few things uh, towards the end? I just wanted to say um, I'm so delighted that all of you guys came and this has been such a successful science cafe. 
if we knew that Axel was this popular, we would have used him a long time ago. Well, clearly we were saving the, <laughs> saving the best for last. But this is not over. There are so many interesting questions. I was just reading through the questions. There's some 70 questions unanswered and they're all really amazing. I want to know what they are. So we're gonna get back uh, to you guys once we figure out a date and a time. It'll be very soon um, because we don't wanna lose the momentum. And we will make sure that we get back to you. We will start with your questions. Please write your questions down so the next time we meet, we can just, we can just uh, pick up where we left off. And that's it. And thank you so much for joining us. Yeah. Thank you so much thank for having us. Yeah. Thank you, Axel. Thank you, Rajni. Uh, thank I'm you. ending the call now. Please uh, be back. Um, you know, be back. Yeah, that's the pun. Be back. <laughs> so be back. We will. We will